Philippines. Um, I, I'm a professor up there, so this talk might have a slightly academic feel. Part of this is based on my learning at the university, but I've also done three startup company companies that have made a couple millions each. And uh, actually, my by far, what I consider my most significant uh, startup has been the Bachelor of Innovation, trying to figure out how I actually do something radical at, that, at the university. So I'm going to talk about something I've been using in my classroom when I teach entrepreneurship, um, and we're sort of based on the lean methodology, so hopefully people have, will understand this as, as they go through it. This is meant to be very interactive, so if you have questions, don't let me keep going. Stop me. If I'm going too fast, stop me. Slow me down. Otherwise, uh, I have this tendency to pick up speed as I go through this. So. So uh, this talk is called Move to MVP. Um, and so uh, if we think about Lean Startup, in fact, even in his book, Eric Ries says that part of the real value of the Lean Startup methodology has actually been defining a lexicon that people agree on that actually help people within their companies better communicate what they want to do but also help them move forward. So there's a relationship between how we talk about startups and how we do startups. Um, but I consider that there's one item in the lexicon of Lean Startup that causes more confusion and sometimes more contention than any other, probably more than every other contention of the Lean Startup methodology put together. And I'm going to introduce a new methodology we call MOVE that helps address those issues and help you understand how you can, once you've changed this mindset, you'll be better at trying to actually move your business forward. So if we think about what we want to do in the Lean Startup methodology, um, they talk about this idea of a minimal viable product. So how many of you think you understand what is a minimal viable product? Okay. Um, so I mean, the goal, of course, is that we want to talk about having something that you give to a customer so you get feedback early on that it is or is not what they really want so that you can then iterate from your demo. Um, it's hard to reach over there. Uh, basically change, get some feedback, update, and iterate through your product design. Okay? And that's pretty much what we want to try and do with it. The problem is that a minimal viable product is often none of those three. It's often not minimal. It's often not viable, and it's often not a product. Okay? But when you call it a minimal viable product, at least for the students I've interacted with and actually many of the non-student business people I've helped mentor, they think minimal viable product means literally what it says, the minimal viable product. And depending on what stuff you read from Steve and what stuff you from Steve Blank and from Eric Rees, in his book, lots of the examples are actual minimal viable products. They are products. But lots of the other ones they talk about aren't, and that just leads to confusion. So I'm going to introduce this idea of MOVE, which is a minimal objective viability experiment to replace it. And by using this, I, I think we can help people move forward. So when we think about minimal and viable, one of the problems we run into is just what does that mean? There's lots of things we could think about as minimal products, but lots of those are actually crappy products no one would want to use. Okay, so they just don't have enough functionality. Viable products have that people want to use, but lots of them are actually too big, too, you know, they're, they're too expensive, they're built by companies that are bigger and fatter and, and more funded than you. Um, and so the idea of a minimal viable product would be one that's sort of at the far right edge of minimal and the far left edge of viable, if you think about that Venn diagram. That's if it really is a product, okay? And that's what still most people, so how many of you when, you, when you said you knew the definition, were thinking of something like this? It's actually minimal and it's a product you could use, okay? That's where the confusion comes in. So during Startup Weekend, we're telling everybody they're working on their MVP. And then people are like, oh, I can't build this in a weekend. So they, they get frustrated in terms of where they're going. What we really want to talk about, um, and here's Eric's actual definition from his book, the minimal viable product is that version of a new product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about customers with the least effort. And you can find it if you don't have this book. There's a website here. So and by the way, if you want the slides, just give, I'll give you my card afterwards. I'll post these. I'm recording it, so I'll actually post a video. Uh, the problem with that, does anyone see a problem with this definition? What doesn't work about this definition? You want something to say that you can solve the marketing problem before you solve the rest or anything else. You want something that just says, is this marketable or not? And that's less than what this is. Well, yeah, that's actually a completely different it's question. right? That, Well, actually, this could be because the validated learning, you've just focused that the, the most important validated learning for you is the marketing problem. Yeah. Okay? So that's actually still consistent with this because it doesn't tell you which problem. But there's another problem with this definition. Right. Yeah. 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 So, in fact, and what was your comment? 
So what is it? Um, so maybe you could do a Survey Monkey. In fact, as we'll see, we, lots of people consider their MVP to be something that Survey Monkey plus something else. The problem I view with this is just so the mathematician in me looks at this and says, okay, this is a two objective optimization problem. I want to maximize something while minimizing something else. Max min problems are pretty common. The problem is they're in inconsistent units. One's in units of learning and one's in units of effort. And I don't know how to make those consistent. Therefore, I don't have any clue how anybody uh, – and, and by the way, and the space is largely unknown. That is, I can't easily sample the space. So no one can really build an MVP by this definition. So when I, when I gave this in class, students and I had conversations, it's like, but I don't know how to measure how much learning I'm going to get out of different things or how much effort we will take. If I knew how to predict how much I'd learn and how much I, I could work, I still don't know how do I trade them off. So if I double my amount of effort and I get four more units of learning, I'm not sure how, what units of learning would be, is that better or worse than the simplest thing I can do with the least amount of learning that comes with it? How do you balance those two off? Okay. And it actually comes back to the question of what's the most important objectives? If you decide the technology is your fundamental block, then maybe you want to learn about that. But this is learning about customers. Right? So that's the other part about this definition. This MVP is entirely about validated learning about customers. To be honest, that is where most people fail, so it's a good place to start. Um, here's Steve Blank, who's an, another big person in the lean startup. His, here's his sort of definitions. He says the minimum feature set, sometimes called the minimum viable product, causes lots of confusion. So even within the community, they know it's causing a problem. Um, founders act like the minimum part is the goal. Our real goal is not a minimal product. It's lowest cost. So sometimes, and you might have heard like Thomas Jefferson saying, right, it's here, I'm sorry, it's a four-page letter. I didn't have time to write a one-page. Right? Sometimes making stuff minimal takes more work than making things less minimal. Okay? It's all about the effort, not about the final outcome. And our goal is really to reduce wasted engineering efforts, code that we never use, things that doesn't get done, um, and to get the product in the hands of early visionary customers as soon as possible. So Steve's here in his description is really still looking at it as a real product given to people, and then you can get feedback. And there's nothing wrong with that. Along the, the, that's, I think, a preferably good definition of minimal viable product. It just doesn't meet all of the needs of where we want to be. Um, Eric Reese has also paraphrased his definition in other places where he says, in other words, the minimal viable product is a test of a specific set of hypotheses with a goal of proving or disproving them as quickly as possible. One of the most important of these hypotheses is always, what will the customer care about? How will they define quality? So here's, he's paraphrasing it, but he's actually paraphrasing in a way that I see is quite different because he now says disproving it as quickly as possible. Cost and time are not the same as effort. I've got to balance out what he means by quickly. But here, here he's now gone to a more general definition, a specific set of hypotheses with a goal of, pro uh, of proving or disproving them as quickly as possible. This definition I actually like better, one, because it's not got this mixed objectives, and two, it's about hypotheses as opposed to maximizing learning. If I learn stuff, but that stuff wasn't the most critical stuff on my path or my, it was is not going to help me in terms of advancing my business, I might learn a lot that I can't use right now. So that's the other part that's really important. If I've learned stuff, but I can't use this stuff for two years, is that really the right thing for me to learn? So, um, in his examples, if you, in, in uh, that, the, link, the link I had before actually has some videos of him giving a talk on this from uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the kinds of examples he gives for what's a minimal viable product range from things like the iPhone shipping without the cut and paste function. So the first iPhones had no way for you to copy and paste from one app to another. And there were lots of people who were like, how could you ship an iPhone without the ability to copy and paste between screens? On the other hand, if that would have delayed shipping by six months, Apple did exactly the right thing because they got it in the hands of people, they used it, they got their feedback. They may have known they were going to get that feedback, but they didn't know all the other things they were or not were going to get back in terms of feedback, getting the app store, getting people to feel what's going on. There's a lot of learning you can do. So figuring out what's the most important lesson. Oddly enough, Apple probably already knew that the missing cut and paste feature was a problem. But you don't want to necessarily solve all the problems before you launch the product. Okay? And that's actually, in my view, a true MVP. They had a minimal viable phone they got out. You know, wasn't the best phone, wasn't the best, but they got that going. But then he talks all the way down to, in some of his examples, a landing page with a buy it now button or a link to sign up and pay for to come see a seminar that he was giving. Right? 
And at a different level, those are some minimal viable questions that are being answered. If no one cares about the product, let's say you made the product free and gave it away. If no one cares, then don't build the product. And that's a really important lesson. Okay? Um, so at that level, but he's still calling that a minimal viable product, even though it's now, uh, in my sense, it would be at best a marketing product. Does this landing page get you to buy my product is now the hypothesis, right? And we have to think out what that is. But it really isn't a product anymore. And so I want to push away from that term. It's really just testing a hypothesis. So, and then he goes, just to confuse our students a little bit more, or maybe not, but it, he goes on to help refine his definition, which confuse our students more. So he goes on to say that an MVP is not a focus group. That's not an MVP. Um, and his rationale is because then you're just sitting around asking customers what they want. Um, and the difference between that and a landing page is what? What do you see the difference between a landing page where people can decide they want to buy your, your, your prototype product, even if it doesn't exist, and a focus group? Hmm? Yes, but a focus group is not an MVP. So he's saying don't do this. Because they might lie. Um, I, would, I would phrase it slightly differently, but that's really the underlying, right? They may not know what they actually want. When you present them with a buying choice, they make a choice. But the flip side was, in fact, pointed out, which is if they don't buy, you also don't know why they didn't buy. We're in a focus group. You can ask follow-up questions. So it's sort of interesting that he sort of separates that off. Um, he also dif differentiated from the software model of release early and release often which is a big mantra among lots of the open source community. You put your code out there, you release it, you're pushing it out all the time, and he differentiates it. Um, why do you think that's not consistent with his, his definition? Why wouldn't releasing early and often be an MVP kind of model? Sorry? Right, so underlying it in terms of my learning, I can release a lot of stuff that I don't really learn much from, right? So balancing learning and my cost, Release early and often doesn't get me there. Um, if we think about the model of maximizing the chance of success, where I want to release a product to make sure that it's a hit, right? well, that's not an MVP because, in fact, very often you overbuild. You think of all the things you think your customer wants and build them all in only to find out that they're not. Um, so if you could actually maximize the chance of a success, however, if your learning lets you know how to maximize that, then that actually is still a good thing to do. The problem is, there's more unknown than there is known, and therefore you can't easily maximize it without more learning. Um, and then the last thing that I've added to this, Eric doesn't actually put this in, but it's implied in both the way Blank and Reese talk about various things, and it's also one of the things I have learned painfully myself, which is an MVP that tests one side of a multi-sided market, market is not a good MVP. Okay? And by a multi-sided market, I mean a market where you have users and customers, and your users might like your product, but the people who would have to actually pay for your business model to work, they don't like the product, or they don't want to buy into the product. Right? And so now you have a problem. If, so I'm going to use Crowdfire, so since you guys are here, right, I'll use that as my example. Um, if you give your app away for free, there might be lots of people saying, this is great, I would love to have this app. But if you can't convince con promoters to pay you, you haven't actually learned the right things yet. So you can spend lots of time doing MVPs for end users about the design, the look, the layout, how you use this app, but the actual paying customers might not actually be answering the same questions. So you have to think about, in terms of an MVP, you've got some learning, but it's not the learning about your business model. Okay? And so at a broad level, if we think about the real goal of lean startups, is to go through this where we have some ideas, we build, we do some coding or physical development, although he lives in the software world, measure some stuff, get some data, and learn. That cycle, uh, which Eric likes to say you want to minimize the total time through the loop, personally I view it as you have to minimize the total time to a successful business, which is probably dozens of iterations around this loop, not just one. And that's the other place I like to draw the distinction between moves and MVP, and which I'll, I'll get to in a couple seconds. What we really want to do is figure out how do I get to a business that works? And if I have millions of users, you can probably find a way to monetize that. But if you have thousands of users or tens of thousands of users and no revenue, you don't have a business model yet. You haven't answered those most important questions. 
So when we think about what we want to do with an MVP, which I'm going to now stop talking about after this, is I really want to talk about how do I move to reduce my risk. So the learning I want to do has to be addressing the most risky questions that I want to deal with. So if I don't address the most critical questions, I can spend a lot of time learning the easy stuff. But what you really want to do in a business, coming back to, is it Lee? Neil, Neil, Neil. Um, Neil said, is the market, will the market accept this? Is this the right marketing strategy? That question, Neil feels, is absolutely the most important, highest risk question. And if, if there is no market for your product, you shouldn't be building it. Therefore, that's the highest risk question you want to answer first. It doesn't matter that it would be cheaper to learn other answers, that I could learn way more other answers about the customers who are going to use the free side of this product. That doesn't teach me, do I have a business? Now, the promoters might not actually buy into the, to the CrowdFire concept until you have enough users. But you, so you have to balance where you're going down this path, but you don't want to focus on the question that where you can collect more data. I could get, you know, depending on who this, you might be able to get 10,000 answers from end users and three answers from promoters. Which is more learning? He once said to maximize learning. What we really have to do is put that learning in context. What we really want to do is minimize our risk. We want to do this most learning we can so we can assess and minimize our risk and come up with a management plan so we don't burn money in a way that doesn't help advance our, our process. That's the real goal. So, well, actually, that was his maximum, right? So like he'll spend $500 to test whether or not this is a viable product. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I wouldn't actually say he's solving the marketing problem. He's solving the market problem. Is there a market for this product? And I'll come back to that in just a little bit as a, as a good example. Um, but the other problem I've seen, and this is actually the one I worried more about and why I said I have to come up with a better methodology is, um, when talking with a student a couple of years ago, um, actually after a startup weekend, where they had been hear hearing about MVP and they came back and it's like, okay, we've built the MVP and we've learned from it. So our idea is validated. Now it's time to go raise money and build a real product. Right? And their attitude, and this is actually to, coming back to the, the, this idea, right? there's actually a huge gap between, okay, I've sold 50 of them, and is it really a big business? There's a whole bunch of questions in between. So it's not like an MVP is... I built the minimal viable product and I proved it out. Now let's go build the whole business. What, what did you actually prove with the minimal viable product? This minimal viable product was a landing page and a survey monkey survey. Okay? That really isn't answering all the questions. So um, I felt, oh, I'd really feel to, to, to get them to get the real lessons of lead. If you read through all of Eric Reese's books and everything else, it becomes very clear that this is an iterative process. In fact, he doesn't see there as being an MVP, despite the fact that its name suggests there is one. He views it as an iteration process. It's all about continuous learning, not one-time maximal learning for minimal cost. You want to iterate this process. And so there's a whole bunch of questions. As I talked to the students a couple years ago, I realized that the MVP terminology added to the confusion because they felt, oh, we've done the MVP. Now it's time to go raise money. And it's like they had no paying customers yet. In my view, they were no nowhere near ready to go raise money. They were ready to go on to the next experiment. But, you know, so you know, they come back. They're, they're all fired up after startup weekend. And this is great. You know, oh, my God, your startup idea is so awesome. And then we have to temper them a little bit. You know, ideas are really a commodity. Uh, an idea isn't what matters. Execution is going to matter. So you have to balance these and how you're going to go forward. Um, a couple of things more aimed at students that, you know, talking about stuff without not actually doing anything, talk minus action equals a word I'm not going to say, um, and that ideas are that, thing, right? It's easy to have ideas. Even going through a startup weekend after 54 hours, having your idea done, done a certain amount of validation, that doesn't mean you can deliver on it. Now, if you did the right validation, 54 hours, you could actually have cust real customers lined up and running. That's great. But most things, by the time you get done, you still have an idea and a vague idea that it's there. And part of what ends up happening is that 
it really isn't about the ideas. Business is about making those ideas happen, and some students then come out across feeling dejected that their ideas are worthless without investment. They've got this, now they want to go out and try and raise money. Raising money is hard. Raising money from the kinds of validations you did from Startup Weekend is probably nearly impossible because that really isn't enough customer validation for almost anybody to want to invest, invest in it. So we want to con change this over to uh, my ideas are worthless about my next move, and you're going to keep going through a bunch of moves until you get to the point where you're ready. So now here's what I mean by MOVE. Uh, MOVE is an acronym for Minimal Objective Viability Experiment. Okay, and here's my definition, a, a minimal objective experiment that will allow you to validate, that will allow the validated learning about the viability of one or more of your hypotheses. In your business model, you're going to have a bunch of hypotheses. Um, and then once you have those hypotheses, a move is a, an experiment to test the viability of that hypothesis of your underlying thing. And a startup is then a sequence of moves and pivots yielding learning about improving the iterative sequence of product services offered to customers. Now, this definition is, again, very general, just like Eric Reese's was, but it's not focused on the product. It's testing hypotheses. So what are some advantages of looking at things this, this way? First of all, it's no longer a pretense about being a product. This is clearly an experiment. So what it says it's going to be, you're going to go out and do that. And it's also not a pretense that it's actually a viable product. But nothing you're going to show. So students are sometimes worried, or actually even the CEO of my second company, was worried that we were showing something we hadn't actually built. This wasn't viable because you couldn't actually use it. He was worried that customers would come back and say, that's all vaporware, which is a concern, and that's one of the pushbacks for lots of people with minimal products. If we view it as a, this is a viability experiment, we don't do it ourselves or the customers into thinking this is a product. This is a PowerPoint rendition of what the product might look like, and we're getting your feedback and analysis before we actually go spend millions of dollars to build this. You want to go through that process. Um, but it's also, importantly, a focus on an experiment. This is not, let's just build it and see what people say. If I do experimental design as a scientist, I think about what is the objective of my experiment, what are my measurements, how do I interpret those measurements, and I'll talk more about those in just a little bit. That's the other important thing about this. You start viewing it from a different point of view. It's not about build a product and get feedback. Because I get lots of feedback that doesn't help my learning. It's designing an experiment to get meaningful feedback. Okay. Um, the other is that this is generally going to be clear that you're going to have multiple hypotheses. There are many potential moves I could do next. And the team has to select which, two, which move balances their learning and their cost. So marketing, market acceptance is a huge unknown. That's why Eric Reese's definition started with the customer. Um, this allows me to balance. What am I going to measure? So $500 to go get, can I prove that there's actually 50 people? Now the problem might be if I think that that's a huge market because I measured, um, I grew up in, in, in the Amish country, I might actually be able to sell things at, at a local fair that you could never sell anywhere else. That market, so there's a bigger question. That's the next question. How big is the market? There's a lot of analysis to do. But it's still a really good first experiment. But if you have a hypothesis about who is your market segment, my market segment is uh, men and women in urban areas between the ages of 20 and 45, then at an experiment level, I want to make sure that my experimental measurements captures that in the way I do it. And doing a craft fair in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, would not give me such a measurement. Right? I'd get measurement, I might even get sales, but it's not answering the question about my market segment that I've identified. So you've got to balance that design question. Um, and then in terms of helping the students, a sequence of moves and pivots is an easy story for people to remember. You sort of move along, you pivot, you move, you pivot, and so it becomes easy to remember um, where that goes. Uh, so the, the next part of this is to, to distinguish viable and viability. Um, which, again, is part of each of our definitions. Um, so something as viable as defined in the dictionary is capable of working successfully. And this is, again, part of what caused students problems with minimal viable product. They think it works, which then, then makes PowerPoint things and landing pages seem a little bit odd. Um, but at a deeper level within the MVP concept, which really is an important concept, you really want to think about what is the minimal product that will get visionary early adopters to actually use the product and give you feedback. Because it turns out that's a critical experiment. If they can't get their hands on it and use it, if I build a PowerPoint demo or a PowerPoint interaction 
get some feedback from customers, and then go spill the million dollars to actually build the next version of the software, that gap is probably too big, and I've wasted money. Um, whereas viability is actually the capability of becoming practical and useful, it's a statement about the, the potential, and it's best tested before I build a product. So this, for, in terms of the definitions, helps people get there. Um, and most importantly, and this comes back to the one problem with the idea of taking it to a craft fair, is the idea may be viable, while the current product build is not. Okay? If I have a hypothesis that this, this thing is something I can sell as a product, I can get feedback on whether or not I can sell this. But it doesn't mean that if I chose a different market segment, a different delivery technique, or a different way of marketing this, this is why it's market versus marketing, right? maybe the problem is, so I built a survey, okay, and during Startup Weekend, you guys you sent out a survey, right? Uh, how did you communicate that survey to get answers? Uh, Facebook. Facebook. Okay. Now, Facebook for your product and your demographic and your team might sort of work because you have friends that are people who would be going to concerts for Crowdfire. If you guys don't know, Crowdfire is a startup weekend. They have a product where you basically everyone's phone becomes part of the light show in the audience, synchronized to what the music and DJ is doing. Right? So your demographic might actually be appropriate for that. If, however, I sent that to my Facebook friends, it would be absolutely useless. First of all, I have, I don't know, a very small number. Actually, with the students in my, my current group, that, that actually has changed because now I have students as friends in Facebook, but my friends and family, my actual friends and family, I don't know that any of us go to concerts. Right? We're not the right demographic. So if the marketing technique was to push that out through social media to people whose social media contacts are A, small, or B, not the right demographic, you don't get to learn anything right, about the actual answer to your question. So in your survey, did you ask age, how many concerts people go to, uh, income demographics kinds of things? No. So you got answers to what do they think about this, but you don't actually know what customer segment they're from. How viable is them actually purchasing? Well, in this case, they're not buying it. It would be free, so it's, it's a slightly different category. But if they never go to concerts, I mean, I saw the idea. I think that's cool. I don't go to concerts. It's not like I'm actually going to be using it in a concert, right? I don't think the Philharmonic would be, hey, let's <laughs> have a light show. That's the only concert I've been to lately. Um, so the idea may be viable while well, the current product build is not, or the idea may be viable, but the market segment is not what I thought it was, or my way of communicating with the market segment is not. So once I think of it as how did I run this experiment, it becomes more clear that when I look at things, um, the data I get back from my experiments tests a hypothesis, but the data may have other explanations. So if I sent it out to, to in fact, one of the problems with Startup Weekends is, in fact, you get basic answers. You didn't get answers from promoters, but you tried to call them on Sunday. Right? Does that mean promoters aren't interested? No, it means they're not answering their phones on Sunday. Right? If you call them during the week, maybe they'd actually answer their phones. It's not like they didn't like you and didn't answer your phone. They have other things to do. So experiments can have lots of different answers. You start looking at it that way, you, you, you get a better feel for how should I analyze my responses. Okay? Um, the other part that's really important in my view is that if you really believe your vision, and I thought I had a slide for this, but I guess I didn't. Um, if you really believe your vision, you need to understand the limits of your experiments when you get negative answers and design another move to change the way you ask the question. So did the, did the answer come back negative because I asked the wrong people? Or maybe even worse, did the answer come back positive because I asked the wrong people? Um, in my second company, we were doing a privacy-enhancing technology, and I did a survey. I talked to a number of big companies, and I talked to a bunch of uh, private, not privacy, um, citizen groups, and they were wildly supportive of us building this product. But when we went to actually try and sell the product, we quickly recognized that they're not the people who buy the product. The people who buy large-scale biometric systems are governments. Governments really that, weren't that interested in what we were doing. We asked the wrong customers. Coming back, not quite the multi-sided market question, but a different question. So then we have to keep working on another set of experiments to figure out where to go. So that's still a very important part about it. So it isn't just that I built a minimal viable product, which my company did. We were building the product for the wrong customer segment. That customer segment loved it, but they actually aren't the ones who ever deploy it. They would want to use it, so it is a multi-sided market. 
but the people who would actually have to buy it for them to use it. So you all have your finger, well, assuming you have a Colorado driver's license, you are all in a biometric system, right? That's run by the state of Colorado. The state of Colorado and you might not necessarily have the same objectives in terms of protecting that data, the usability of the system. Their objective is we want to make it quick and easy at DMV to collect the data and make it easier for people to search through that data to make sure you're not getting to driver's license. And potentially, if the police decide they want to search for your fingerprint, search for it. <laughs> right, we will come back to that. That's, in fact, a very important difference between focus groups, which is actually why Eric Reese isn't that interested in what people say, and actual products that measure stuff where you get observable behaviors. And we'll talk about uh, the observability and objectivity in just a second. So, um, so, But the other issue that is important that, again, students don't always get is not all viability questions are about customers. Sometimes viability questions are engineering. Can we physically build this? Right? You know what? If I could build an actual hoverboard, there's no doubt I could sell them. Right? Things that have no wheels and float in the air and anti-gravity, right? but I don't know how to build them. So you've got to balance viability of the market would buy this versus viability can you build it. Um, others are actually costs, coming back to the production side. I don't have to necessarily answer all the production questions, but if my costs are inconsistent with what I hear back on pricing, then I might not still have a business. But I might if I could figure out how to drive those costs down. So there's a bunch of directions. And really, once I've come up with a formal hypothesis, you can design a move, an experiment about the viability for almost any dimension you worry about. Technical, uh, cost, competitive advantage, um, can I actually get IP? Right? There's a bunch of stuff where, yes, you could sell this, but so can all these other people. And even if I started selling it, they could eat my lunch tomorrow. Right? So if I have a product that is an add-on to Facebook, and I can't protect an intellectual property to keep Facebook from just implementing it tomorrow, it's a very risky business. How do I test the viability of it? People may love it, but Facebook could eat my lunch in an hour. And so I'll never, I'll never really compete in that space. Okay, so the next part that this helps, now that we've focused on this being a, a viability experiment, we've talked about viability, we can go back to talk about the other word that's in move, which is objective. Okay, and so what do we mean by objective? So the first thing that you have to understand from an experiment, from a science point of view, is experimental data can only reject a hypothesis. I can never prove something experimentally. When I have a large enough experiment and I fail to reject the hypothesis, the, the, the sort of null hypothesis, then I can accept it. You'll see statistics where people think, talk about stuff like P equals 0.05. So with 95% confidence, I've rejected this hypothesis and then very often I turn it around. So your hypothesis might be that, um, come back to the, the actual end users, that 50% of the people thought this was a cool app and they would use it. You go out and do a measurement. Okay? If I get a large enough sample of people and 50% or more of them say that that's, tr that, that that's true, you actually haven't proven the hypothesis is true, but you've rejected the opposite hypothesis right, that of your sample, it's unlikely that if I were to do another random sample of similar like people, I'd get a very different answer. So statistics allow me to reject hypothesis, but they actually can't prove that it's true. Okay? The other part is that for almost everything about human behavior, the answer to a question changes over time. Experiments are a sample of a point in time. And so you have to put in all the extra caveats. Of the group of people at this point in time, communicated this way, we can reject or, or, or not our hypothesis. Um, but most of the learning actually comes when you reject these things. Um, if your sample size is really, really large, you start getting th tens of thousands of people, you can pretty much say, yes, you've shown your hypothesis to be true in, with all the other caveats. But the other thing that's also very important is that all measurements and feedback are not the same. In fact, when you design an experiment from a science point of view, we often worry about the difference between subjective and objective measures. So, and what do I mean by those? Well, Asking people what they think, feel, desire, those are always subjective. Okay? In fact, they're subjective in a very biased way. How I ask you if you like something may, it, may be affected by the color of the page on which I asked it. Okay? There's a bunch of psychometrics that go into designing good marketing and advertising. So if I just ask that question, 
I can get very biased answers depending on how I phrase it, how I color it. The font. There's a ton of stuff that goes into effective marketing, and that people already know all that stuff. Well, if I'm trying to do this as an experiment, I've got to worry about all of those biases. But the, by far the worst problem is what people think is not how they actually behave. If I ask questions, and this is the problem I ran into in my company with respect to the, the privacy stuff, if I ask people about privacy, it's important. If you actually observe how much will people pay for privacy, you get a very different answer. Right? If you look at, okay, so how much do they have to give you at the supermarket to give up your privacy, to give up your name, your you know, email address, your phone number, whatever, they give you a quarter a week or you know, a dollar a week, depending on how you want to view the discounts you get. People do that stuff all the time. So they're giving away their private information. Even though they worry about it, they then give it away at almost no, pro no cost at all. So their behavior is different than if you ask them a cognitive question. And this is because this is part of the reason this kind of stuff is subjective and often very wrong. So measuring behavior can be objective or it can be subjective depending on what behavior I measure. So the example I gave of measuring what people pay for privacy or pay not to, to give up the privacy is an objective measure. They went through this, they, they, they did this behavior. If I actually ask about how often people avoid a camera that has a screen looking at them, which is another privacy kinds of question. If you go into a supermarket and there's a store, there's a camera, but there's also a monitor right next to it, well, that's now a bit subjective because unless that's the way I always deploy my systems, I've modified the environment and that changes their behavior. If I give you feedback, that feedback may change your behavior then makes it more subjective because now you've got, moved up to the cognitive level of thinking about what's going on as opposed to just behaving the way you normally would. So there's some odd behavioral questions you have to do, talk about. So, but from an objective experiment, this means I really want to try and get to things where I measure behavior without the user knowing I'm measuring their behavior, because that's the most objective kind of stuff I can do. Um, and then the other thing that a good experiment will do is it will actually analyze the potential for what are called effect sizes and the power of experimental design. These are very formal terms from science, but the effect size says, so how different are you from the norm? So if I had some baseline, some what we call the null hypothesis, which is for CrowdFire, right, I go there and I don't take part in this. How much does your system, your, your measurement, measure my behavior compared to that? So if you gave it away for free, you could ask the question, how many people actually used it? Okay. Um, the power of experiment would then say, well, given that you measured 1,000 people and 50 of them that you tried to give it to didn't use it at all, that helps you understand the chances that things will happen randomly. Um, and so that, that's, if you ever get into that, you can ask somebody at university for statistical help. Um, but by far the bigger problem and that you, you have to deal with in terms of an objective experiment is a secondary question, which is, is this experiment measuring what I need it to measure? That actually has nothing to do with objectives in the traditional sense of the data, but my objective, the word gets, ends up having two meanings here, which is, what am I testing, what is being measured, and why? So if I formulate a hypothesis and the test of what, so first I should formulate my hypothesis and test of what will be learned before the experiment. You don't want to go collect data and then mine it later to figure out what it tells you. You can do that. That's a perfectly good way to learn. That's just not an experiment. An experiment I should have formalized, here's what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to test, and this is what I'm going to learn from it. And the reason for that is to make sure you're actually measuring what you want. So if you wanted to check your, your demographic, um, then you need to answer that. So your, your app didn't have pricing, but if your app was something that you need people to buy to get your app, then if you, if you didn't ask about how many apps they buy, you missed a critical part of what you needed to learn. So by formalizing that up front, it helps you design your instrument, your measurement device, to make sure you're measuring the right things. Um, so for example, if I have a hypothesis about your idea, um, is the hypothesis about the idea or how I communicate the idea? So if I build a landing page, with the idea that this is about my idea, and I build one landing page, and I get results, either great or bad, did I measure the idea, or did I measure how I communicated the idea? Right. I actually have a little bit of both, but I can't separate the communication from the idea. Um, a classic way to, to sort of make some of those things better in an observational system is to actually do A-B testing, by which we mean you have two versions. Right? And now I can test which one works better. In fact, if they're both communicating the same idea equally, they will work about the same. 
if one works better than the other, it actually used often the marketing side to say, this is a better way of communicating it. Okay? On the other hand, if the, you get a discrepancy and neither one shows the idea is good, you might still get the feedback that maybe you're not communicating it well. And I've learned this myself in my own, my own companies um, that I had that as a problem. We would communicate it, and the customer, actually eventually some of them ended up liking the idea, but it was a give and take it before we could communicate it properly to them. So that's an important thing. Um, is a hypothesis about the customer segment or how to reach the segment? So the example I gave of reaching the customer segment through my Facebook channel would just simply never get there because my Facebook friends are on average over 45, and they're, well, they might not be anymore, but you know, that's not the right demographic. That's a marketing question. Did I get to the people I needed to measure or not? And I have to measure the properties of the people to test that customer segment. Um, so in many views, the goal of a startup is a search for a viable business model, okay? not just a viable product. It's a viable business model. So I'm going to have some guest best of my model. I'm going to do some experiment, my move, evaluate it, gain some in uh, insights and attributions, and then revise my model. And that's the important part is you're trying to figure out continuously, is my idea worth pursuing? And my idea is the product idea, the marketing idea, the customer idea, the pricing idea, the manufacturing idea, the production idea, the distribution idea. There's lots of ideas in the business. All of those ideas are hypotheses you can make and then test through a series of these experimental processes. So the, often the, the lean process, because it is really driven largely in the software review, has customer discovery validation in this loop where you pivot, and I'll talk about pivots in a little bit, um, until you get them done. And then after you've got your viable business, then you keep working on uh, creating new customers and building the, co the company and growing. Okay? But a key of this is every time through this loop, it is not just build, learn. In my view, it's build, sorry, take, take something, experiment, evaluate. Okay? None of those may be building. Those may all be on the same exact product where I do other tests. Right? So I'm building something. I'm building my move and my experiment but not necessarily building another version of the product. Because if the last set of experiments gave me some learning that I'm not sure about what it means, I just want to iterate again, learn more, and go through the process. And now, yeah, I probably will hopefully be advancing my product along the way, but you don't want to spend too much time advancing the product in a direction that's not proven yet, or at least you know, is not reasonable given your experimental data. Sure. Okay, well, so at some point, it depends on how far you want it off the hill. So I'm going to use the analogy, and hopefully how many, everyone here know what, what a pivot is? Okay, I'm going to give you my definition and my analogies, which maybe will help answer that, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer through that question. So in the way I think of a pivot is I've started someplace, and I have a goal. That's my vision, is that company that does something. Okay, and as soon as I go out, I measure some data. Okay. And very often, the first thing I do is I walk up, and all of a sudden, we enter the valley of despair, and things are not the way we thought they were. Okay? And so now I have to do something. I have my, my initial strategy has failed. Okay? And so I'm going to get some measurements. And with those, I'm going to choose a new direction. That's my pivot. I'm literally going to change direction and then move on. And hopefully, that will take me to some new point where I will get a new measurement and a new measurement. Okay? If I follow that sequence well... I can eventually, hopefully, get to my vision. Now, in some of those places, in fact, if you think of this as climbing, and I'm walking, come on, wake up. Um, uh, so sometimes I can have little pivots, and other times I can have these really big pivots. Um, that depends on how different. So by a big pivot is, you know what? I used to think this was my customer segment. So you know, now this is my customer segment. It could actually be, I used to think this is how my product worked. Now it's this is. I've, I eventually use the term restart when I have changed my vision. As long as I'm aiming down the same general path, those are all pivots. Okay, we had one team that started, and their goal was doc stock. Their goal was to do software documentation. Um, they completely, in my view, restarted to be a company that was going to be an interactive narrative product where they're going to tell stories. Right? That's, yes, there's text involved, but other than that, 
really. It's a pretty much a different product. I wouldn't call that a – I mean, that's – it's either a major pivot or just a restart. But um, restarts often actually change people, so in that sense it was considered. So a data driven change in the model or strategy while keeping the same vision is how I define what a pivot is as opposed to a restart. Now, coming back to your question, sometimes if I were actually to view this as a topology map, I could walk down in that hill. And I could get into a deep hole so deep I can never get back to that vision, at least not with the resources I have. And that's not uncommon. You basically follow a bad turn, and then you follow another bad turn, another bad turn, and you're in the valley floor, and you can't get to the top of the mountain today, if at all. Right? Um, so yes, does it happen? All the time. One of the reasons to view this as a series of experiments is you keep analyzing them, which I'll go back to the previous slide. Um, analyzing your experiment is really important. You have to do what we call attribution of the outcomes to the hypothesis and ideally um, have some quick form in some quick form or have some formal testing. So this is often where it fails. The experiment gave you data. The data is. The data, it can be wrong if you had a bug in your collection software or whatever, but in general, the data is. The problem is often your interpretation of that data, which you says makes me say, go this way, and in my case, for example, I talked to groups that were way too worried about privacy. So I thought, yes, we're marching down a really good path. Right? But they're also the only ones who answered my survey. So there's a problem with surveys or other techniques, which is actually called survey bias or responder bias. If I send out 50 surveys and I get 10 back, I need to know in my industry, is that normal? What's the normal response rate? If I send it out to 10 people and 10 people answer, what does that mean? Those that might be the only 10 people that care. And as long as I understand that, okay, I used to have a market of 50 people, now I have a market of 10, that's okay. But you have to interpret it properly to understand where you're going. And that's something that, you know, that's between you and your team to un understand that. So it can cause a problem, but. The, the, I, I consider the people who pay the customers. The other people are users. Okay, so, right. users <laughs> customers. so if he came back with, you know, these estimates and all this data that he, that he mm -hmm. thinks supposedly was trustworthy and service and, mm -hmm. and, and proven his hypothesis to be so valuable that everybody would mm -hmm. want to do it out there, the software game or the ring or whatever, but he, So I would say fault is a, is a funny word, right? So everyone is taking on a part of the risk. If you remember all the way back in the beginning, the whole goal of this is to reduce risk. The company has to help reduce risk. The customer, if the customer is paying and they're not getting what they wanted, then the customer made bad decisions about risk. So part of the answer is all of them should be doing whatever they can. They're all, they all have their own small attribution of risk in the errors, right? But the experimenters, the designers of the original product, they definitely have a part of it. But so let's say he, they did that and they collected the data and they were missing stuff. So the worst they really need to do is once they decided, oh, look, we don't actually know what our demographic is. We don't have all that extra data. They can try and estimate it because they can actually look at their friends. I mean, if they know all the people, they can literally go back 18, 22, male, female. They can answer those questions themselves or they can run another experiment. Um, it is, in fact, not uncommon, I would say, it's the norm in good science to run an experiment twice or three times. The first time we often call a pilot experiment. It allows us to estimate the variance and the size of an effect and how much people are answering. And with that, we can design a bigger, better experiment where we also check that the questions work, make sure there's no other problems, and then go out and do a larger scale experiment. And that's the second time. Very often in good science, another independent group, not even the same group, will publish a paper that does exactly the same experiment but running it themselves. So you now have independent verification. Because you can have lots of experimental bias. Besides the responder or the survey bias, I can have a bias because 
when I did this sur- when I when I did this measurement, right, I did it in Colorado Springs. Uh, it's really hard for me to replicate an experiment in San Francisco. So some other group might need to so in every experiment are explicit and implicit hypotheses. The explicit ones are the ones you wrote down. The implicit ones that are true for everybody in your population or the majority of your population that you didn't write down. So if you ran that here, that's a natural bias. Right? And again, if I go back to the example with farmers in Lancaster, right, they had a different set of values and what they were looking for in products than the majority of Americans. That would be a very biased experiment if I happened to run it at my local fair because of the population I lived in. Um, so you have to feel how those go. But it, who's, who's culpable? Well, who's at fault? Everyone, no one, right? Lots of mistakes happen in business, and they're not always like someone's trying to defraud the other. So I'm not sure the this information, like the, this idea of how to run an experiment. I would say this is true pretty globally, and if you want the very, very large scale uh, experiment that showed this, look at the Russian and the Chinese planned economies, where they actually say, we will tell you what production will be and what consumption will be and how wrong they almost always were, right? The market, the people using it and buying it are the consumers, and in the long run, they're the ones who are going to drive what will happen, and that's a bunch of people. There's no way to know what a bunch of people will do except measure it from what those people do. So they redesigned their experiments. So it, and that, that's true for lots of big corporations. They run lots of these experiments. So that's the other part that I was going to get to towards the end. Everything I'm describing of this move, minimal objective viability experiment, it's not a startup thing. It's a business thing. It doesn't matter how big you get. The question about viability is the only part that makes this a startup thing because startups are very worried about viability. But guess what? Every new product launch, every new service launch, every new change in an existing organization – actually faces the same questions about, is this a viable change to what we want to do? And so you could view this as a general business model for what's going to go on. Um, so next, last thing about experimental analysis. Experiments, don't actually support a real conclu- sorry, experiments that don't actually support a real conclusion are common. That is, you get this data and it doesn't really answer a question. You have to be very careful once you look at it as an experiment to, to avoid what we call post hoc rationalization. I can look at a bunch of data especially a small amount of data, and say, this supports my position. On the other hand, somebody who's against your position can look at exactly the same data and say, this doesn't support the position. And we have that, there's only one thing to do, another experiment, get more data. Data is often not going to be a decisive answer, especially if you get a small number. How many survey answers did you get? 10, 15, 100? Yeah, so you get 100, you start getting pretty meaningful data. You get 10. You know, you can go with anything, depending on what random 10 people answered. You can get a very, very wide um, uh, thing. So you want to, you're, you're always looking at what's your next move. You want to continue progress by making a move or a pivot and then moving on through that hypothesis. Skip what is a pivot. So notice as, as I want, continue filling this map, as I explore the space, I learn more. That's sort of the, the learning that's going on. Um, and hopefully you then get to your grand vision. Um, now, one of the questions I often get from people, and this is a really good question about this whole learning from the customer, is you do have to balance the learning and your vision. Um, and understanding the big picture, the customer's easy responsibility and your company's role in solving it. Um, this is a quote from Henry Ford, that if he had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Right? If he'd actually done an experiment right, and he gave people a choice between faster horses and carriages, the majority of people still would have gone with horses, right? Because it's what they're used to. It's what it's comfortable with. As you have a sort of uh, changing paradigm that changes the way people act, the way they behave, you have to understand that process of change and how one manages products in a new product space as opposed to a product that's like other products. You have to understand what it is because it's going to change the way you view your experiments. Henry Ford's experiments were actually really good at measuring customer acceptance. But it's not like one in a hundred thinks it's a good idea means this is a bad idea. 
in his view, one in a hundred think it's a good idea, says, well, there's millions of people. That's a good idea if you can actually get those people to move. So you've got to balance how you interpret all that data to, to, as you go through it. So it's not just look at the data and say, oh, no, it's bad. Um, so when you go to Tesla's hypothesis, the data may have other explanations. For example, people don't understand this. They're scared of it. But after they get over their fear, then they'll like it. Well, that's, that's a big explanation. But guess what? That explanation is itself a hypothesis. You can go back and test again. Okay. Um, if you believe in your vision, you need to understand the limits of your experiments and then design another move. When you get bad news from your experiments and you really believe in the vision, you keep going out and testing it. Okay. The batch of innovation, which was going to be one of the examples I talked about through this, um, for me, I tried this idea and I failed. I failed miserably to achieve my objectives. Something happened at Lehigh and you know, it was okay, but I failed. But instead of viewing it as the idea is bad, the idea has failed, I viewed this as what did I do wrong, how do I go about changing what I did, and then I went and did it again. Now, that experiment was expensive. I had to change universities, move my life, come up with a new way of trying to make the process work. And it wasn't as much at all the idea, but how I implemented and sold it. So it was a marketing question, but I had to understand how I had failed to market it before. I had marketed it, I had given it to people, I had gotten feedback, but it got destroyed because I failed to market and understand people's resistance to change, coming back to the same thing with Ford. Right? The people, when asked about what I wanted to do, didn't think it was a good idea because they were used to the way things were done and they didn't see the need to change. So I had to change my marketing strategy even though I didn't really change the idea. So I had to understand what went wrong in my experiments. And um, then I already mentioned this one. Not all viability is about customers. There's lots of engineering costs and competitive advantages, things you have to worry about. Um, in my second company, one of our biggest questions was not, do customers want it? We got that pretty quick from customers that they wanted it. What we didn't know is, could we build it and make it work with the infrastructure costs and design constraints? So we had a lot of other experiments that we had to run afterwards. But again, it wasn't just talk to the customers and run away and hope it works. Along the way, we found a customer that got prototypes as we tried out various things trying to minimize our costs or keep our costs down while we balance them. And that's an important way of looking at it. So we had lots of designs that included customers and lots that did not. Um, uh, so is it helpful or not? So in an experimental design point of view, there's actually two different strategies. One of them is continuing a customer. The problem is you're now running a slightly different experiment because every time you run an experiment, they learn. So you're now testing a different customer. And after a couple of iterations, this is literally a good question because we ran into this problem. We did have the same test site. We had, a lot, we had an instrument and do lots of stuff. By the time we were at the second or third iteration, that customer really understood what we were doing to help them. But as soon as we went to go to another customer, we had to start the education process all over again. In fact, you'll hear about this. There's a lot of products for which the cost of educating the customer is too high. The product is good. The customers will like it once they understand it, but that cost to train or educate the customer is so high, the product's not viable. So that's, that's the problem with using the same customer after a while is you've answered a question, but it's now a different question because you have a highly educated customer. Um, so coming back to, to uh, MVP, so if I want to look at what Eric Reese says, the MVP is for the visionary customer that feels the pain, and the great thing is they can feel in the missing features of the product, they solve a real problem, and they're more likely, more likely than you to understand if the product works or not. So this is some quotes, again, from, from his book. That's what he describes as what the MVP does and why it's important. And that's great. Um, but before I can get to a product that does that, I probably need lots of moves before I can actually build that, right? before I figure it out. One of the most important things is Eric says that, well, it's for this visionary customer. Who is the visionary customer? How did I decide what their demographic was, what the segment is, and how did I reach them? Those are all questions I have to get to long before I can have this nice interaction with my, my, my uh, visionary customer. Um, so those kinds of things are good to try and formalize and test. And in fact, once you figure out who that visionary customer is, then you can get to building the real prototype. Um, so the last thing about a move, and this comes back to um, a question I think two different people asked, right? A real MVP is a product with a minimal feature set from the customer's point of view. Um, but actually, it's almost never minimal because if I really want to do it right, it'll need a bunch of non-minimal features to support the experimental analysis. 
So, for example, your system may, use, may never, ever use your customer's age, gender, demographic, uh, economic or socioeconomic data, but you still might want to need, measure that because it's going to help you test your hypotheses. I don't need to know where they live to know if they like my product, if they can use my product. But I do if I want to use that same data to generalize to market size and answer other questions. So oddly enough, the fact that, that it's minimal, if I need to learn this stuff, I have to have these as features, even though they don't help my customer. Um, and as I said, you might need to do things like measure time for events or support A-B testing. I might build extra features into my MVP, the actual MVB product, to measure stuff that I would not normally do. My second company's products, we put in all kinds of instrumentation to measure when the customer was moving the mouse, where the mouse was, because we were trying to understand how they actually use the product. We had, in the first version we de delivered to them, almost as much code in the user interface to measure stuff about how they used it as there was to actually draw and manage the user interface, because we didn't know what they were going to like, what they were going to do. This was a radically new concept for them, and so we just instrumented the heck out of it to measure all kinds of stuff. Um, and that was actually the most important part of our design for that product was, for the first version, was to get those measurements, not to actually make it that useful. useful. So, so coming back, so now that we're, you're, if you're looking at it as an experiment, what is your hypothesis about why that information might be useful? Is it about how you're going to scale to other restaurants, how they receive? So do you market the same to men and women? Many companies don't, right? You have to figure out what's your hypothesis and then think about how you want to test if that hypothesis is true. So your gut feel, and there's a lot of value to gut feels and what's going on, they give you a possible hypothesis that you can then go out and design the experiment to go test. Right, so is that information important? I don't know, because I don't know what you want to do with it. But you can figure that out by thinking, what is my hypothesis? Let's say you had all the information. What do you think would be true about it? How would you use it? And then you can design something to go test that. OK. Um, so in fact, that is the end. What's your next move? Um, questions, comments, feedback? Neil? Experimentally. Okay. Experiment. Experimentally, you can never prove something is actually true. You can only disprove when it's not true. That just the, the, the core of lots of science is this idea of falsifiability, and that's an underpinning of lots of scientific theories. So, for example, Newton's laws of motion. Right? Newton's laws are an approximation that we eventually learned were false. Despite we had hundreds of years of experiments, that were always consistent with Newton's theory. In the end, it wasn't true. Eventually, an experiment proved it wasn't true. Right? So that's the kind of thing that works in terms of what you can and cannot do. But again, the overwhelming odds. In practice, Newton's laws are true in every situation in which you can really measure them. Now we have a theory that says, yeah, they're pretty much true until you go fast enough and have dense enough objects or whatever. Um, but that just has to do with the fact that you can never sample everything. So if you have a, you can have a statistical hypothesis, but even that is only going to be true with respect to the populations. So what often fails is the assumptions underlying stuff, which you can't test at a different level, sort of goital-like level, right? The incompleteness theorem says that within the space of things we uh, define our axioms around, there are things we can never prove, and that experiments just can't prove all the way outside that. But pragmatically, if you get you know, thousands of answers and they're all consistent, you've experimentally shown it's a really good probability that it's true. Right? So at a certain point, you get to like the probability that you're wrong is 0.0000001. So you're wrong that often. Who cares? <laughs> Well, you can't prove that it's always true. You can, yeah. you, you, you can, experiments can measure what they measured. What you can extrapolate from them 
is where they become problematic. So, um, so that's why it's hard for them to prove a theory. But again, pragmatically they do, um, but you really want to design your experiments to prove when your idea is false, because that almost always takes much, much less data. If I can get, so if I assume that something is true 90% of the time, and I run an experiment, and I've measured 50 items, and it's only true 30% of the time, I'm pretty sure it's not true 90% of the time, right? There's actually still a chance that it's true 90% of the time, and I just sampled all the wrong people. So, so there's more snacks before you guys go. <laughs> Risk. Risk. It's reduced risk. Well, no, so, this, so, the, the, so there are hypotheses about production costs. So, yes, yeah, so there's a slide that just talks about that. Right. So, in fact, to be honest, right. So, a different question about viability is about the value of your product. So, if I can raise the value of my product, then I can raise my cost and my profits, which is really where Apple is going. And that's often a very good hypothesis. It's just it requires customer education and stuff. Then you have to go through that process. So, lowering costs. Actually, here I just said and costs. I didn't actually say lowering costs. So, no, that, that's everyone I talk about costs. And to be honest. Costs can be, I need to, so if you talk to a lot of people and they think they'll only pay this for a phone, right? and to be honest, Apple was a little smarter than that because most people don't pay directly what Apple wants to charge for the phone. They have a split market. You pay for an iPhone and AT&T pays for the other half of the iPhone. It's hidden in your costs. And that, that became, as a continuing cost, over the life of the contract, which is what most people, so by having that business model where they've actually hidden some of that cost from you, you're also willing to pay more. So there's lots of different questions about customer perception and cost. So the hypothesis here doesn't have to be lower is better. It could be, in fact, there's lots of products for which, are, which are sold as premium or you know, prestige products. Right? If they're prestige projects, they have to charge more. Right? It's not, I mean, so it doesn't, how much better is a, what is a fancy watch this? What, but then, so, but even the, there could be lots of them that are exactly the same shape, right? In fact, you, there, are, there are plenty of products for which they, are, they not only look the same, they are the same, except for branding. But people will pay for branding, right? That's a, that's a perception of value question. So around that space, you can form a hypothesis about what matters and what those customers are and how you reach them, and then you can go out and test that hypothesis. And if they're going after that, that becomes a very important risk reduction question to get that answer to that kind of question. Um, so actually, I, I'll, I'll treat this as a three-way question. How do you know when you've done too much experimentation? How do you know when you should give up and, and move on to do something else? Um, and the, the last part of it is, um, I don't know how to answer that question in a general sense. So how do I know how to give you that advice? Um, so those are the three parts of that. But the first part, how do you know when you're doing too much experimentation? There's a point in which the cost of the next bit of learning versus your current ongoing revenue is small enough or low enough that it's not the return on investment you want. In a broader sense, you want to look at all of these experiments, 
are about a return on investment, but you have to do your accounting differently. Um, in the startup, uh, Lean Startup book, they talk about innovation accounting. You have to somehow measure the value of that learning. When I said before, four units of learning. I don't know what it means to learn four units of this, but after a certain point of time, if you, if you can start executing and actually get paying customers and reduce the amount of experimentation, you, what you really have to do is think about how, how can I now get revenue and do experimentation at the same time? The harder question is, when do you decide to give up? And that comes back actually to the broader vision question. This privacy thing I've been talking about, I started that idea in 2001. I worked on the technology for three years before I had a solution. Then I started a company in 2004. I still don't have, I've, I've done small pilots and little things. I still don't have a major customer for that, and I refuse to give up because I actually see the problem that the rest of the world, so, uh, maybe I'm just delusional, right? and I don't give up easily. Um, but part of that is, if it's a problem that the market isn't there for yet, if, so my experiments have actually shown that there are pockets of people who care, but the actual paying customers, the governments who do the, by far the very largest deployments of biometrics that people worry about, okay, those people don't care yet. But my belief is, so until, until this year, um, so this is a sort of odd story, but um, I've been talking about the, the risk of biometric data compromises. Password data, you know, credit cards have been compromised for years. Millions and millions of those keep getting compromised. But I, when they get compromised, I just cancel my credit card get a new one. Not a real big deal. My fingerprint, once it's compromised, it doesn't get revoked. It's my fingerprint. This year, the federal employee fingerprint. The federal government's now actually starting to say, hmm, maybe we do have a problem here. So my view is, I'm not giving up, but I'm also not spending money on it. I've mothballed it and keeping it around. I keep going. I'm running anymore. I also quite haven't given up. five or six, and I say, this one's no longer as good as that one. I'm going over here. Other questions? I'm not sure what a true entrepreneur is. Um, who don't have and actually, at points in time, I, I can have There are no other ideas. I am king of execution. And I would actually say the best entrepreneurs definitely have that characteristic. On the other hand, something starts failing, so I'm getting negative feedback. Then they also naturally start looking at alternatives. Right? They're, 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 funny enough, I think most entrepreneurs are actually very risk averse. And when the risks start piling up high enough, they start looking at where is their lower risk to go. 